public administration policy analysis. She's a certified practitioner in strategic human resource management and a certified uh, OD practitioner. Uh, all of her degrees and certifications were earned after turning 40. Much respect, much, much, much respect. It's never too late to learn to advance your education. Amen to that. On a personal note, she's been married for 27 years, has three grown children in her 20s uh, who are beginning their life's journey. So I wanted to just make a hearty welcome for Ms. Thomas. Thank you so much for coming. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Fantastic. So as we get started, everyone, as I mentioned, for those of you who might have just joined, please feel free to show your lovely face. We'd love to see you. Uh, if not, that's cool, too. We understand you're eating or doing something cool. Uh, as we get started, I'm going to ask some questions um, of Misty to kind of get us rolling. And the goal here is as informal as it can be. It's just a conversation. OK, so if you have questions when we get to the end, please save them. Ask them because Misty is a leader in our country, not just the community. She's a country leader. This is important. So if you've got something great you want to talk to her about, now is a wonderful time to ask her. So to kick us off. Uh, Misty, if you could, please elaborate on what experiences uh, have led you to your current career. You know, I, I would be very remiss if I didn't give you all my childhood statistics. Um, I grew up very meager beginnings. I was a child in poverty. My parents were were very hard workers, um, but without college degrees, my dad uh, worked for himself. He was injured. There was no insurance. So um, I'll bottom line it for you. My mother worked for four dollars an hour and supported six people. You can imagine what life was like. My dad grew up in the Great Depression and didn't believe that social programs were for us because we had food every day. And in his childhood, they made decisions on who ate and which days. So social programs for people in poverty. So we never had a mindset we were in poverty, even though we, we really were there. Uh, I, I should be a statistic that you all are pulling quantitative and qualitative data on to write your research papers. I was pregnant by 19, married by 19, a uh, lot of trauma. So I just want you to know that there was no family money. There weren't affluent names. There was no privilege. There was no nobody that came in and rescued me from the woes of poverty. And the reason I tell you that is because there were people who said things that were transformative in my life that have led me to where I am today. And at the end of this, I want to give you the three principles I operate in in leadership because they changed and transformed my life. The first was a U of L professor. He was a dentist that I worked for when I was 16 years old. I had braces and he knew that I needed some income and he liked uh, he liked me. He said I had a um, great chaired side manner. And when I began to work for him, he encouraged me to go to UofL at 18 when I graduated high school in 1994 and start the dental program. Well, what he saw in me was I'm a communicator and math and science do not play well in my, in my brain. So uh, after three semesters of being very frustrated because I was in a wrong program and just the, the survival mode that you were in when you were in poverty, you were always hustling forwards, you're hustling backwards. You just are trying to get out of the day. Um, I ended up uh, pregnant and married. So my education was put on hold. I had, I had 17 hours that I could, could build on somewhere in the future. Um, the next transformative thing that happened was it, in my time at UofL, I had a professor, she was my literature professor, and she stopped me in the hallway and she said, Misty, I don't know what you're doing with your career and your life, but I want to tell you, you're, you're an excellent writer. And I thought nobody's ever told me that before. So I took that and held on to it. When I was 29, I uh, was working uh, in catering and I uh, came across the owner of our local radio stations and we were having a conversation. It was his birthday party. And he said, can you write? And I said, well, I had a professor once tell me I was a very good writer. And he said, do you know anything about journalism? And I said, yeah, I had a class in high school. He said, I like your voice and I need a news director. I can not give somebody a voice, but I can train you to be a journalist. Would you be interested in looking at the position? And that moment changed my life. Because when I took the position, a couple of things happened. I began to learn the fabric of my community. I had this very unique uh, uh, perspective. I sat behind the microphone as the news director for the entire county. And it was my job to watch the wins and the woes and to write stories about them. I got to uh, to create a rapport and relationship with basically everybody in the community who is in any part of the political sphere, leadership, school systems, nonprofits, and just local citizens. Uh, even our felons. I can't tell you how many stories I've gone to our jail because we have federal penitentiary and how many stories I've written to listen to their stories. And 
um, I, I fell in love with my community, but I also learned who the major players were. And I, we then developed radio shows in the morning and I became the most trusted news voice, especially female voice in my community. And I knew that. So I knew something had to happen. I didn't have an education. I just had the ability to communicate and create rapport with people. And I knew I could write and I was learning how to write and I was learning how to do this job. But I also knew that I would lived in a glass house and every step I took was being watched. So I knew uh, very quickly that my morals and my integrity had to be forefront in every decision I made. And before I knew it, 10 years in, I had created social equity and I'd never had that before because I grew up in poverty, right? You don't, you don't have social equity. People don't care what you have to say when you're just a kid in poverty that blends in with the rest of your community. I was asked 10 years into my broadcast journalism career to work with a grassroots campaign to create a, a transitional living facility for women and children. Um, I, I took a sabbatical for my job. I continued the morning shows, but I took a year off. It ended up being almost two years. Um, and I ended up being the program director. I was supposed to be the community educator and development officer and ended up the program director and wrote a program. And we, we brought women in uh, we were creating an environment of, um, we had teenage pregnant, we had people coming out of jail, we had homeless, it, it, and we knew we needed to narrow our, our search down to who we really wanted to help. And I did a uh, needs assessment in the community and found that there is this group of women who, there is this group of women who, they're in poverty. They're not in domestic violence, they're not drug addicted, they're just in poverty and their children are being placed in foster care. So I went to the court systems and I went to Child Protective Services and I said, here's what we're thinking. We want to bring these women in for a one-year transitional, transformational living experience, but we need you to allow their kids to come live with them on property so it glues them to the program. And they, they let us do it. They let us bring those kids out of foster care and, and live with their moms. And we had three newborns stay on property. And I tell you all that to say this, it's because they trusted me. I had worked really hard to build this integrity and this trust in the community. And it was the first time that I stepped back and went, what just happened? I am this kid from Caneyville in poverty who I have no education. I have, I've, I'm bringing nothing to the table, but that's when I realized that if you create relationships with people and you are integrous, it will change other people's lives. And I had five moms and 11 children that at the end of almost two years, they're still together. Those babies were supposed to be adopted out. Um, and my life made a difference because I had lived my life in a way that people trusted me. And so at that point, I realized um, when I went back to broadcast journalism, there was this hole in my heart for nonprofit work. And I thought, okay, maybe I need to go get my education. I was also being pursued by um, a political party. They wanted me to run for a state rep. Um, I ended up saying no to that and yes to um, nonprofit work. But I called um, UofL one day and I got a hold of uh, Amber Scott Roberts. And I said, I just am trying to get into school and I can't seem to get in anywhere. Why is this so hard? Why is the paperwork so hard? And she said, here's what you need to do. You need to do the OLL program. And you're going to be able to finish that bachelor's pretty quickly. And then I had this moment where I was graduating with OLL. It was combining with this moment of realizing I wasn't going to run for state rep. And I was lost in my mind because I thought I was going to be in the political sphere. And I met Dr. Sharon Kerwick at my graduation. And I walked up and asked her, um, are you graduating? And she said, no, I am. And she tells me, you know, who she is with U of L. And she said, what's your next step? And I said, I don't know, Dr. Carrick. I, I really don't know. And she said, you need to go into the HROD program. And I said, well, it's too late to apply. And she said, no, let's see if they still have room. And she made that happen for me. And I'll never forget that because she used her social equity to advance my career. And um, I did that program in a year because I just wanted to put my head down. I didn't know where I was going. I was really crestfallen over not running for office. And it kept me really busy. But what I learned in the HRI program was it, it gave me framework for all of this raw talent that I knew I had, but it began to build structure for me. And I loved that so much. And then I applied for the position at uh, Red Cross and ended up in my position now as executive director. So 
that's a long answer to your question, Dr. Sheffield, but I felt like it was necessary. <laughs> that was wonderful, Misty. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, because we're being recorded, Dr. Carrick rocks. For anybody who doesn't know, Dr. Carrick is wonderful, and I want, and I want this recorded playback to her so much. She's absolutely wonderful. She's um, she is. Thank you, Misty. Next question. Education and continuous learning are crucial, as uh, you've obviously just highlighted many times. Uh, how do you continue learning, and would you elaborate on the one learning event that's transformed you? Um. So every morning I get up and I listen to podcasts. So I listen to three podcasts a day. I do something spiritual because I, I practice faith. And then I do something, it's typically a TED talk, but I also follow a couple of life coaches. That is something mental. So a spiritual, mental, uh, and then I pick something that aligns with what I'm learning. So right now I'm listening to a lot of things about weather and weather patterns. I'm learning more about um, how weather happens, because in my chapter, we are handing out weather radios and doing community uh, preparedness classes. And I just like to fill in with some color that um, I like to be a little extra when I make presentations. So uh, just whatever's working, you know, whatever, uh, when I was raising my kids and we were learning budgeting, I would listen to podcasts about how to teach your kids budgeting. So I try to do three a day. Um, my organization offers a lot of personal development opportunities. If your organization does, I try to do something on Friday within the organization. Um, if I had to say there was one learning experience for me that transformed, I would say that it, it was really just the HROD program. I loved the OLL program, uh, but the HROD program really fine tuned for me. Uh, a lot of the inertia and the nuances of what I love to do, which is coach and mentor and uh, recruiting and uh, all of that space, you know, all of those classes that you're taking in that program. I walked away from that program feeling like I had been awakened to who I, I was really built to be. So I would say that it was just the HRI program as a whole for me. Excellent. Thank you, Misty. That was wonderful. Right. Um, next question. Communities tend to uh, thrive when people are engaged, as you well know, because you're so engaged. How do you foster transformation within the community and foster connections with others? Is there a, is there a recipe is what I'm looking for? How, do, you, do you find that there's a norm and a typical thing? And would you be willing to share that, please? You know, so yes. And uh, I don't know that you'll love my, my second part of my answer, but it, it really is where I, I see more transformation happen. The first one is get involved. Get involved, bring your education, bring your experience, bring your diversity, bring your background to a board. I promise you nonprofits are always looking for board members to get involved with your chamber. You can you can join a chamber as a personal member, but that's where you're going to really learn fabric of community and who and build your network and who's doing what. Uh, um, chambers are incredible places. I had the privilege of working in media, but if you're not working in media, that's going to be your next step is go to your chamber. And that network you're going to build there is incredible. But in the nonprofit spectrum on a board is where you're really going to be able to make some differences. The second part of that answer is um, now hear, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not encouraging you to get involved in political debates when I say this, but here's what you can do and I do a lot, is I will hear people having conversations that have erroneous information in it, and I will correct their information and re-guide re them. So ex example, um, at a basketball game one night years ago, there was a road being developed, the contractor gone bankrupt, it sat in front of subdivisions, the subdivision owner, uh, homeowners were at the ball game. They were ready to tear that. They were tearing the mayor apart. And they were ready to make a social campaign to tear the mayor apart. And they had really put together this great grassroots campaign to get this road completed. And as I'm listening, I realize what's about to happen in my community. We're just going to have this bomb of uh, our mayor being destroyed over a state highway. This wasn't even his highway. So I just just said, hey, can I help you? I love your energy. I love that you all want to have a grassroots campaign. I'm all about democracy. Uh, but that's a state highway. So who you need to contact is your state representative, the Kentucky Transportation Department, take all that energy there. And they got something accomplished. 
But had I not interjected the right information, it would have just been really ugly for my community and people upset and the mayor taking a, you know, a hit that he didn't deserve. So I'm always listening for those conversations about the community where people are complaining about why don't we have a movie theater? Why don't we, why won't the city put in a skating rink? And I always try to say, hey, this is why. This is how it works in government. This is where you need to take your energy. Find an entrepreneur who loves skating and wants to put something in and maybe I can connect you. So I like to connect people because I have that advantage of knowing who's doing what, who the major players are. I love to connect people. The third thing I do is I always talk to my servers at restaurants. If they're a talker, you know, you know, those servers who want to, want to, want to live life with you for a minute. I always say, what's life like for you? What's your plans? What are you doing? Where do you volunteer? And I always say, what do you love to do? If you could do anything, what would you love to do? And they'll say, you know, I'd love to be a firefighter. You need to, you need to volunteer for Red Cross and show up at house fires. You're going to be the person on scene giving people money and, and that shoulder to cry on. You know, I love this. I love that. I love our military. Well, you need to do this in Red Cross. Or, and if it's not something we do in Red Cross, then I'm always planting a seed because it's, you're, you know, I was going to say that generation, but it's any generation should be involved in volunteering and you're going to see an enormous um, uh, amount of people on a network build for you enough that you may have never experienced. So those are the three ways that I try to engage and connect people in the community. Uh, Misty, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, on a side note, I loved hearing about you started this discussion off with data, data being what led the discussion versus emotion. I just had a conversation last night about this with a group of students and talking about the, the, the importance of evidence building and finding the data and letting the data tell the story first, because then everybody's emotions tend to be a little calmer. So that's wonderful to hear. You, you just absolutely supported a wonderful position. So thank you so much. Um, by the way, for the team, I always want to know where I'm at. We've got four questions left, just so everybody knows this is important for my for me. And I know it's important for everybody. So four questions that we're doing. Love the discussion. Uh, Misty, how do you uh, think continuous learning and transformation will inform the future? Um, my future? <laughs> um, you know, currently I'm, I'm working through my doctorate and my dissertation will start in August. And when I started my doctorate, it was going to be uh, surrounding public housing because of what I'd see with Saving Hope Charities. After the tornadoes came through, and I worked in response for 90 days and I'm still working in recovery uh, with 13 of my 25 counties. I help stand up long-term recovery teams and my dissertation now is going to hopefully create a case to plead to legislators or to a nonprofit that they will place an urban planner at the table of long-term recovery teams. Because what, what is happening or what could happen are maybe two different things. Uh, the, the misfortune that cities have been wiped out and they have a clean slate by Mother Nature, uh, it's unfortunate, but there's also an opportunity to build back re more resilient, smart technology, smart cities, walkable communities, uh, maybe re change the land use that you have a subdivision move where you bring in um, a landing strip for small airplanes so you can recruit industry. And these are the things that uh, because of my urban planning classes and my doctorate, I'm looking at and thinking they're, they want to build back so quickly to get people home, businesses reopen, that nobody's stopping to say, would you like the opinion of an urban planner? So I'm hoping to prove that case that Red Cross or the government or FEMA, somebody, somebody needs to supply us with an urban planner to really build back communities that are newer and what we want to see in, in our uh, communities instead of just expediting something very quickly. So, um, you know, I'm always learning. I'm hoping that that my education transforms the long-term recovery game for those nonprofits that work in disaster and those communities that um, they find themselves having to stand up long-term recovery groups. So, that's my plan. That's uh, that's my goal. That's that's the answer I have for that question. <laughs> Misty, thank you so much. So much interconnectivity. Um, I think back to your comment earlier on studying weather. You know, I immediately went. To, I can't help it. I went, immediately went to the butterfly effect. Right. Yeah. I, I immediately went there. And and the tiniest changes in the world do truly have the largest impact, even though we can't see them. We feel them. Right. We eventually. So it's wonderful. Wonderful that you responded that way. Thank you. Um, so this is a little bit um, more personal, but I think useful here for the team. Uh, is there a favorite book, novel, 
or movie that has shaped or impacted your life, you know, it just, and, and you don't, you know, there may be many, but just one that really stands out and, and what, what, it, how did it, how did it influence who you have become over time? Um, there's a couple of books. One's called The Serving Leader, not Servant, but The Serving Leader. And I love the recipe in it. And it, and it actually comes with a, a training that we're doing in my division with Red Cross. And if you have negative Nellies on your team, this is going to change their attitude. And I love watching our negative Nellies who uh, they, they, they need a voice on the team. They need to balance out, you know, the optimistic, we're gonna, you know, no risk involved. We're gonna run with towards the go. Um, but it really is a great formula, but I can tell you the this one, this one I, I want all of you to get, it's called Strength Finder. This is an incredible book. And I think there's 22 strengths in here, but it, there's a test that comes with it. You're gonna find your top, top five strengths and it's gonna change your team dynamics uh, because it's gonna teach you how to operate in your strengths. It's gonna tell you your, your, your balconies and your basements, you know, how you do it well and how you don't do it well, how you annoy people. But it's also gonna tell you how to work with people with strengths outside of yours. And uh, an example is I'm a strategist. I'm the only strategist on my team. So when I started and we would have leadership meetings, everybody would be ending the call. And I'd say, wait, 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 wait. So what's the plan of action to meet the goal? And I, I was just wearing them down. You know, they just, they're not strategists. They didn't care, but I need to know, I need to know the goal. I work it backwards. And then I think of roadblocks. I'm a risk mitigator too. And so now they look at me and they say, hey, Miss, do you can put a strategy together and send it to us? Yeah, I'd love to. But like, you know, my heart swells when they ask me to do that. I used to annoy them. But once we learned each other's strings, I annoy them less when I want when I want to put a strategy. But they also know that and I know that they they're not going to put together strategy. I'm going to do it and share it with them where some of their strengths I don't have, I now call and say, I need your perspective on this. So it's created a really great culture for our team. So that's the book that has really, um, the nuance of that, Dr. Shelfit, I think has refined me even more as a professional and working with my team. So I love that book. Fantastic, Missy. Thank you so much. I annoy Susan a little bit less every day, but it's only slight. It's very small. It's a very slow dick. Dec I'm sorry, Susan. Also yeah. reported, I might add, but no, that, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so as a point of reflection, what advice would you give a younger you? Um, you know, I, my, my dad would always say, Misty, the only thing you have is your name. And I didn't understand that when I was a teenager. I didn't really care. I wanted to do all the things other teenagers were doing. And I got into my 20s and I was just a really angry, angry 20-year-old in poverty with uh, three small kids that I loved, but I didn't really know uh, how to be a good mama. Uh, what I would, in my 30s, I had a transformational experience in, my, in a spiritual awakening, awakening and really learned who I was. I would love for the 15 year old Misty to have had that awakening. And really it was just about sitting down and saying, what do you believe? What do you want to operate from? Because you can never lead if you don't know who you are or what you believe, because you'll be all over the place. You will let circumstances dictate you instead of your moral compass and beliefs and leadership dictate the situation and change it. And I let situations push me around until I was in my thirties. Um, and then when I really, got in touch with who I am, why I believe it, and I could defend why I believed it, then I, then I started to change the atmosphere around me instead of letting the atmosphere change me. I would love for my 15-year-old self to have had that strength and that knowledge of really who am I, why do I believe what I believe, can I defend it, and now can I go out and shape the atmosphere and set the temperature of a room instead of letting it dictate to me. And that's where really I think good leadership it comes into play. You have to have that foundation first. I don't care what you believe, but you have to know what you believe and you have to be able to defend it. And once you can do that, then you can sit behind a microphone and have a conversation all day long about any topic because you have already gone through it in your mind and you've studied it and you've researched it. So I would love for my teenage self to have been able to do that. Misty, you're an absolute inspiration. Thank you so much. <laughs> you are. You truly are. I, I yeah, you're, you're absolutely wonderful. I'm so glad we started started here with your experience and knowledge and education. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I guess the final one is is really, um, you know, what do you have? Is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't talked about today? And then I'd like to open it up for the audience to ask some questions, if that's OK with you. Yeah, you know, I, I told you in the beginning, I want to give you three principles that uh, I operate in that have changed and transformed the cultures that I'm in. And um, 
The first one really comes from two places. It comes from a motto that my dad always taught me. And it's coupled with a, uh, I'm assuming you're all familiar with the Ten Commandments, but there's in the, in the Bible, there are Ten Commandments. And one of those commandments comes with a promise. It's the only commandment with a promise. And it's about honor. So the first principle is honor, honor people. My dad always said, treat the person in front of you like the most important person you've ever met in your life. And when you truly do that, think about when you have people around you who you really feel like are more important than you, what do we do? We do anything we need to do to impress them. We begin to remove roadblocks for them. We work above and beyond our job description. We, we pull out our finest clothes. We pull out our finest parts of our character to impress these people. And if we just treated everyone like that, that's where diversity, equity, inclusion will come into play. You know, we think diversity is just what we see on the outside, but it's, it's really about our experiences too that we're bringing to the table. But let's get past that piece of it. I think equity inclusion is where we fail to operate we, we do, I think we're doing better about diversity, but we need to also get to equity inclusion. If you're treating every person in front of you, like the most important person you've ever met, you're removing roadblocks for them to create equitable work situation. You are including their voice. You're valuing their voice. You're bringing them to the table. You're remembering that they're there and that will change your culture. The second one is, um, relationships, build relationships with your people. And if you operate an organization that's 2000 people, then build the rapport with your direct reports and then encourage them to build rapport with their and decentralize that idea. You cannot create equitable and inclusive situations if you don't know who your people are. If you don't know what's going on in their home life, if you don't know they're a one car family and the car's broken down with three kids at home, you can't offer a work from home situation to, to help remove that roadblock. Uh, you know, until some things can happen. You can't, you can't offer to maybe pick up the Uber bill or whatever it is, but that's equity. That's saying, how do I get you and your time and talent treasures to the table and what roadblocks do I need to remove it? And once they're at the table, then you, you know, you can include them. So build relationships, build relationships for your professional network. You have got to meet people. You've got to be able to know who you are. And I promise you, when you are able to tell people who you are, instead of formulas around things, um, you're going to leave a lasting impression you're going to build your network. The last one is speaking to people's lives. And as I have, have shown you at the beginning of this, when people honored me, when they brought me to the table, when they removed roadblocks from me, when they mentored me because of my raw talents and they spoke into my life, they transformed who I was and, they, and it encouraged me to continue on. If you see raw talent in people, I say this when I speak at, um, uh, school organizations tell your friends the good things about them i like how how good you are with math i like how well you organize people i like the tone of your voice um i've been watching you and you seem to be very hospitable i think you would be great on our pr team and then follow through don't just say it follow through and find development opportunities for them in your organization Share with them, hey, I'm going to work with HR and I'm going to look for some training opportunities in communications. Would you be interested in that? And retain them because this is going to change your culture. It's going to up your job satisfaction. It's going to reduce your tone of turnover intention. And it's going to create a culture where people like to come to work because they're working and they're work anchors, right? And I never saw those things in me. I never looked at the mirror and went, oh, you are a good communicator and a great writer. Like that was never something I said to myself. Somebody else had to see that in me. So be that for somebody else. Those are the three principles I, I am constantly operating in that have changed my life, my career, and it's changed other people's lives. And you'll create that social equity too for people. And, you know, I just, I always want to leave people better than I found them. And I always say, I have a podcast. It, it's It's been out of commission because of, um, COVID and tornadoes, but I started a podcast called To Be Missed, and it's a play on my name. And really it was, I want to become a woman that people miss her presence when she's gone. I want to be that person. You know, those people in your lives that you could just sit at their feet and listen all, all day long. You want their wisdom and knowledge. I want to be that woman. And how do I become her? I'm not there, but I'm working every day to become there and to become her. And if you're working on yourself that you think, I want to leave people better than I found them. And I want people to want to be around me you're going to do dynamic things in your community because the doors are going to open for you because people want you on their team. They want that energy on their team.
Misty, thank you so much. Absolutely fantastic. We really, really do appreciate it. I'd like to open up the floor for any questions. Uh, we've got a, maybe five to 10 minutes tops, but you know, wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to speak with Misty today because as a leader in our community, uh, these are rare moments and uh, we certainly want to make sure that we honor both Misty and the time that we have to ask some great questions. So please, the floor is yours. Anybody who'd like to ask a question or two. Misty, this is Susan. Just a quick question. Can you um, let me know the name of that book that was leadership other than the strength finders? Oh, it's called The Serving Leader. Can you spell that for me? S-E-R-V-I-N-G. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Raphael. See, thanks for sharing all of that. That, that was amazing. Um, and then I can appreciate, I'm going back to school for a master's. I'm, I'm over 40 also, so I can appreciate that experience. It's it's a lot. <laughs> but uh, one, it sounds like you've you've dealt with a lot of folks, whether within government and, um, you know, corporations and, and other areas. Um, I always call it, I um, always try to learn like new tips to, I, I call it leading, leading up. Um, do you have any recommendations to uh, like influence um, up, even though your role is not quite there? So um, maybe explain to me what the goal is so that I understand the question a little bit better. Uh, for example, let, let's, let's stick with a volunteer nonprofit. Uh, let's say you want to convince your executives and board to partake in a volunteer event or uh, partner with this organization. How do you, how do you kind of go about doing that to kind of to, to get them sincerely clear to value, uh, value of that? So I always say you have to believe it first and you have to be able to tell the story. So if you're wanting to partner and do something that's outside of the normal framework, you need to know why you want to do it. And then you have to be able to sell them on the story. So you've got to become a great storyteller. And if you don't believe it, you're never going to sell it. So I learned a long time ago the power of no. I have to say no to a lot of things because I get invited to a lot. I only now involve myself in things that I am passionate about because I'll show up and make time for those. The rest of them, I'll find reasons and really good excuses why I can't come and that I'm failing that organization. And I've done that too often. But but really know why you want to do it and then tell the story. And you will sell them on it if you really want to do it. You'll make it happen. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you, Raphael. Anybody else? Any other questions? I have a quick question. Yeah, Brian. Uh, I'm just curious on your thoughts and perspectives on like, you know, we always want to have the like, we're having a great experience. Everyone's included. Everyone's working hard and great. But like when you have that employee who or person or whoever that you're just like, I feel like I've tried all the things I'm doing all the stuff. And this person is just like not meeting the standard. Like, how do you have that hard conversation, whether it be, letting them go or just like what are you know how do you have that hard conversation with someone who's like on your team and you you like and want to support them but it's clear that this may not be going well you know so let me tell you a story about jenny jenny was a mom with two kid, two daughters that we had brought out of foster care to live with jenny and jenny was faking heart attacks to get out of her work Jenny, Jenny tells the story now, so I, you know, I don't tell somebody's story without their permission, but I was going to have to let Jenny go from the program and the two daughters were going to go back to foster care and I was agonizing over it. And when I went to tell her, you have to move out in five days and we're going to transition the girls back. Instead, what came out of my mouth was, Jenny, if you could do anything all day long, what would it be? And she said, I would go to my grandmother's assisted living facility and help all of those elderly people all day long with their needs. That's what I did when I was homeless and I would sleep in my car at night. And I thought, okay, let's get Jenny a job at the assisted living facility and see if this changes. And all of a sudden Jenny started coming in and telling me stories about who she helped that day. And she no longer stopped finding excuses to go to work. So I'll tell you that story to say this, Brian, 
make for sure they're operating in their work anchors, because if they're not happy with what they're doing at work, they're going to be negative. They're going to bring all that energy to the table. They're not going to meet their goals. They're not going to meet their metrics. Some people will, but when I find that those people are in that place, so if I were you, I would start, let's sit down and look at what are your work anchors? What are your preferred work anchors? What would you want to do? You could do anything and let's fit that into this company because I don't know that you're well positioned within the organization. Maybe if we position you differently, then you would come with all the enthusiasm that I know you can bring to the table. If that doesn't work, then you're probably going to have to have a different conversation that you're just not meeting the measurements. And that's where performance man you know, management comes into play. But I would start there because I've seen that transform so many people in the work atmosphere. They love the organization, they hate what they're doing and they don't know how to say that. So what they say is they just kick against the bricks. They just word vomit, as I say, all of this negative energy and, and, you know, it's, you know, all the things you're dealing with. That's where I would start personally. Hope that helps. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Misty. Other questions. I don't really have a question, uh, Misty, but I just want to say thank you first for your time um, and also just uh, you're an inspiration. I am a student uh, back to school, um, definitely in my 40s of um, younger kids. And, you know, there aren't a lot of students who look like me. I, I'm in the OLL program, probably more so, but um I never thought I could do it and I thought it would be hard. And um, I was really struggling with where I was gonna go to school and how I was gonna finish. And then um, I was introduced to Susan and Susan has been like my my guardian angel. And, um, you know, I, I, I now have can see the end of the tunnel and um, have a clear focus. So thank you. It's just really encouraging to hear from someone who has traveled my path and has been extremely successful in it. And so I really do feel like I, I, I just needed this encouragement today. So thank you. Good. I'm glad. So yeah, be encouraged. You know, the kids are going to grow up. Mine are, mine are gone. Uh, they're in their early twenties doing incredible things. Uh, but you find your yourself in this, you know, sometimes we call it a midlife crisis. I call it a mid career crisis and you age and you think, you know, I just, it's just easy as women, especially to, to get really low. But what I have to remind myself is my life will make a difference for somebody, but I have to keep putting in the energy and showing up for all of those people. Uh, you know, when the tornadoes hit my chapter, I was just eight months into Red Cross and COVID. So I, I really didn't know what to do. I had not been trained uh, for it because we don't have disasters that big in Kentucky, right? And I made it my mission that if I did nothing else but show up at headquarters and say thank you to those 997 volunteers that came in over a 90-day course, that's all I was going to do. Um, they ended up giving me a lot more, a lot heavier workload, and I ended up doing a lot of media. But that I just wanted to show up and say thank you. So sometimes just showing up for yourself. Um, and so I'm so excited for you. I'm so excited where you are because you're going to you're going to really see some doors open for you. And uh, your life may go in a totally different direction, even when the kids are gone. So it's a lot of fun to live a life when you have the education in your pocket and the knowledge and the network, and you've built that for yourself to really go, I made it. And now I, I want to do good, or I want to change this organization, or, you know, even the people's, even if you're not working in a nonprofit, you're working in a uh, for-profit, um, change the people's lives around you, make their work life better, make it easier for them. That's, that's huge. So thank you. Thank you, Misty. Laura, next step, Master of Science in HR. I'll be calling you after this. So just so that very next step for you. So we're already pretty proud of you and I'll be looking for your application. We'll talk yeah, about Susan it. Susan will be looking for my scholarships too. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Year, Lord. You can do it. <laughs> Brilliantly done, Laura. Brilliantly done. All right. Last question from anybody on the team here for Misty before we wrap up our call today. Any other questions? All right. I will close us up. Misty, it's been an absolute honor. Uh, we are so appreciative of you being here today. And you have been, like I mentioned before, an absolute inspiration for us. And we really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, again, thank you. We really do appreciate your time today. Thank you all. Best, best of luck to you all and all you're doing. And when you're ready to volunteer with Red Cross, let me know.
<laughs> Fantastic. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks again. Have Nicole. a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.